Okay, good morning everybody. I'd like to thank the organizers for bringing me in from Harare, Zimbabwe to share my um, product with you and the experience that I have with elections and civil activism in Zimbabwe. I'm going to take a slightly different approach from the two speakers because I'm not going to try and show you the tool in action. Uh, I think what I'd prefer to do is try and be a bit of a bridge between the activists amongst you and the technology. So more a question about the opportunities for using the tool than how the tool actually works. And seeing as I'll be here for a couple of days, hopefully those of you who are interested and would like to talk about the technology and experiment uh, with it will be able to do that with me. Because I have brought uh, some of the equipment that one would use for Freedom Phone with me. Okay, so the big challenge for those of us who mobilize around elections is that the election cycle lasts a lot longer than the election itself. And our challenge really is how to complete the information picture knowing that election monitors are on the ground for a very short time in the duration of the election cycle and often their movements are somewhat constrained by the government that's invited them to come and do the elections. And that goes for us too as election um, uh, monitoring activists. Our access to different parts of our countries are often also quite limited, meaning there's a lot of stuff that's going on that we don't get to see or hear about. So, um, having a look at what... I, I've pulled out four points, some of the challenges that we've got to address with the tools that we build and the work that we do. So one of them is that the cost of mobilizing formal monitors around a country uh, is really expensive and the duration that those people are with us is a very short period of time. So the opportunity is to look at ways in which we can take advantage of people themselves. In other words, how do we facilitate the crowdsourcing of information now, there are a lot of tools out there, but many of them are dependent on the literacy of uh, your population. And although uh, literacy rates in countries like Lebanon and uh, Tunisia are very high, that's not the case in many other countries. Um, so we'll have a, little bit, uh, a look at, at some of that a little bit further on in this presentation. The other thing is that a lot of the dirty business that surrounds elections happens out of sight. But one thing we know for sure is that almost in all incidences, somebody somewhere will have seen or observed that incident. How do we make it easy for those people to share information with us? The other thing that's really problematic is whomever is the incumbent the people who are in government at the time of an election often have a huge opportunity. That is the ability to abuse the state structure for their own purposes. We need to use tools that can reach out to populations and make them very clear about the fact that that's not okay. Now in countries like mine in Zimbabwe, the government controls all radio and television. And because they are able to mobilize police and army and militia, it's very easy for them to shut down or to put in place uh, barriers to information sharing. So we're having to look at tools that can jump those barriers and enable people to tell us about what they're seeing and then use that information to mobilize the media if we're lucky enough to have a free media in the countries in which we operate. The other thing is invariably the losers in an election will say it wasn't free and it wasn't fair. And it would be great if we have ways in which we can try and inform ourselves about whether their claims are legitimate or not. So I hope that you will see that Freedom Phone and other platforms that use interactive voice response, that leverage voice, have a role to play in addressing some of these concerns. So the words in orange um, highlighted there on the screen are the points, I think, that make voice compelling in certain situations. They address literacy. Um, in certain countries, 
the, there are limitations based on the character sets used by those languages. For example, uh, Khmer in Cambodia is not, uh, it's not easy to use with SMS. And people often have to go full back to phonetic representations of their language. So with 160 characters, SMS kind of breaks uh, and you can't really use it. Um, the other thing is the challenge of translating our materials into the multiplicity of languages in which our countries communicate. And indeed, using tools that enable people to articulate what they're seeing comfortably and thoroughly. Um, you often find that language and voice is the best way to go. The voice is not an easy um, medium to manage, though, so I'm going to be very clear about that. For the panelists who were talking about uh, elections and challenges earlier, it's already clear that the volume of data being worked with is intimidating. When we throw voice into the mix, we add to that complexity. Um, and I, I think that tools are growing in the background pretty quickly to help us work with audio materials, but they're not here and properly available just yet. The important thing about voice is it's harder to fake and it's really compelling. So if you're lucky enough to be able to work with radio, being able to receive voice reports is a really great opportunity to be able to transfer those materials into radio broadcasts. So just very quickly to have a look at this issue of literacy, you can see that in Tunisia and Lebanon, the number of illiterate people are relatively low. But if we go to some of the other countries, even though literacy rates seem high, there are still millions of people who can't read and write. And usually the greater percentage are women. So if we don't introduce tools that people can use with their voices, we basically take away the opportunity of all those people to contribute to information sharing. Um, I just dropped in this slide because I was very interested when I was doing a bit of browsing that the literacy rate in Afghanistan, in Herat province, is as low as 15%. Can you imagine how that makes SMS and tools like that completely redundant? And yet, speaking to others here at the conference, the rate at which access to mobile networks and handsets is growing is really amazing. So these are opportunities we've got to grab and integrate with the other strategies that we're using. Um, so the information sources, as also discussed earlier on today by the panel, pretty much are in these spaces. We have election monitors who are educated, informed, know what they're doing, get to be trained, uh, are <laughs> even with training don't seem to be able to contribute information in more than 50% accuracy, possibly. Um, we have trusted networks with a similar situation where they're likely to be literate, and there should be opportunities to train. And then there's the general public, the valuable unknown, who are everywhere and one way or another see everything. But trying to manage contributed information from them is tough, it's difficult, and their literacy is unpredictable. So I thought it was useful just to have a look at what happens when we take people out of the city and out of their offices and push them out towards the polling stations around the country. Obviously, these days, um, the most important device they take with them is their phone. And we most probably find that in 75% 75 of the places that they visit, um, they'll be able to use those phones. So when we talk about the election monitors themselves, we could use tools like SMS and MMS and voice. And if there is internet connection, we can look at Twitter and smartphone apps, etc. cetera. Um, when we come down to this other space where the, the literacy and competencies uh, are a bit more unpredictable, I think we'll find that voice is the lowest common denominator that we can consider working with. So what does Freedom Phone offer and what is it? 
Freedom Phone is a software platform that you can install very quickly on a basic PC. It installs Ubuntu Linux, and uh, within 20 minutes or so, you can have a telephony server up and running as long as you have the devices to insert your SIM cards into and connect to your computer. The big plus, and this is what we were aiming for when we started this project, was to be able to share a product that did not need the internet to work. As the internet has penetrated increasingly and successfully into many countries around the world, that's not as compelling as it used to be, but it's still a very important feature. Also, the public, or whomever it is that's telephoning into your service, can use any, any, any kind of telephone. No smartphones necessary. And you can set these systems up so that they can provide information and receive information 24-7, through the duration of your campaign. Well, how about practicalities? It's all very nice to have this technology, but what happens when you're operating in a country where the government doesn't want you to do your job? Um, that's very common in the region in which I work, and especially true in Zimbabwe. So, um, realistically thinking, in order to keep a Freedom Phone service running, chances are you're going to have to run it as a closed service, one in which only the people in which you're working know about the telephone numbers and are invited to share information. Why? Because it's very easy to close down a service that's based on telephone numbers. All it takes is the government to pressure the mobile network operators, threaten their operating license, and they shut your phone numbers down. So I think we've got to be realistic about what we can do with these tools. So uh, uh, I suspect that for many of us in these sort of closed networks, we'll share our phone numbers with a select number of people, and it's also possible to white whitelist the service so only those people are able to phone in. Um, however, it does seem that increasingly there are countries in the world where you can run without those sort of constraints. And those are uh, countries in which you can literally make the phone numbers public and have people call in and share information with you using voicemail or SMS. And you can also publish these interactive voice menus that allow people to um, access information updates that you produce. So it's kind of like a mixture between radio programming and, uh, and, and standard information services. You have to build these audio files for yourself in order to populate an interactive voice menu. I think I've, I've dealt with that, but the little sticky in the top right-hand corner there just indicates that the features we're using are voicemail, voice menus, and incoming SMS. their campaign manifestos, etc. And there is a dialer version that enables you to phone out to a phone book of phone numbers if you want to actually proactively connect people to your information. 
I think Americans know what a, what a hassle those services can be, but I think here in the developing world, uh, they're tools we should experiment with. So what do you need to get started with Freedom Phone? Well, my experience as an um, activist in civil society in Zimbabwe, the first thing you need is courage, because governments that don't want you to do what you do can get pretty nasty. So you've got to be absolutely determined, determined to um, accomplish your mission of sharing information with the public, making sure that they can share theirs with you. Uh, and technology is always a bit tricky, so you need to be prepared to go through the bumps of getting it up and running. Besides that, you need basic computer. You do need a bit of specialized kit. I have samples with me for anyone who's interested in having a look at that stuff and a very limited number um, of devices that I could sell if people are interested in them. The lowest cost device um, is about $60. It's a basic voice-enabled GSM dongle. And the more expensive SIP device, which can take four SIM cards, is about $1,500. Um, that's basically what it would cost you to set up one of these systems and Literally, because it's so easy to buy a SIM card here in Tunisia, I would have been able to set up my service and have it up and running by tea time today, uh, as long as I'd brought my, my audio materials with me to set up my IVR. Um, yep, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. Uh, those are some images of the devices. This is what it looks like in Zimbabwe. <laughs> And I think that quote says it all. Those who vote decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>